Back in 1999, following a fire that had burned down a large portion of the Fernwood Country Club, Ido Lampanenik Sr., who was known to most as Diddle and a few of us as Dad, wrote a document entitled A History of the Fernwood Country Club. He came to own this task after two seemingly simple slip-ups that led him to realize that the job of capturing this club's history would inevitably fall to him to own. The first slip-up happened when Diddle agreed to help another gentleman named Greg Brooking, who had decided to research and record the club's history. Both Diddle and Greg quickly discovered a dearth of available content, largely due to the two separate clubhouse fires that had occurred across time. So despite Diddle's dedicated digging, there wasn't much material to share, and Mr. Brooking soon found his interest in the project dissipated. Not long after that, Diddle ran into the then club president, Bill Wiltshire, at a cocktail party, and he mentioned his failed attempt to help Mr. Brooking. Apparently, Dad also mumbled under his breath that perhaps he himself should take on the mantle of this mission, given that he probably had more history in his own memories than likely existed anywhere else. By Monday of the next week, Bill expeditiously sent a letter to all club members stating, in fact, that Diddle Enix had volunteered to become club historian and would soon publish a full accounting of the club's history. In Diddle's own demure words, I plan to be more careful of my cocktail chatter in the future. However, he quickly followed by saying, I'm glad that Bill held me to it as I've enjoyed writing this brief history, and I hope it will add a little to the rich lore of what has been a great institution in Pike County for so many years. So a quick toast to Bill for his service to the club and the key role he played in ensuring that the history of this club was captured for posterity. And a second toast to Diddle for taking the time to author this document that my comments here will draw so deeply upon. The community of Fernwood was founded as a company town by Philip Enix Sr. and two of his brothers in the late 1880s after they had formed a lumber business from their home in Crystal Springs. They eventually decided to expand beyond Crystal Springs and they stacked themselves north to south by age, the oldest brother remaining in Crystal Springs, the middle brother moving to Goleman, which is near Hazelhurst, and the youngest, Philip Sr., moving to Magnolia. Philip Sr. then married Emma Justina Lieb of Magnolia in 1890, and they had several children, including Philip Jr., who was born in 1901. Around the age of 21, Philip Jr. returned to the area after attending Purdue College, and he became involved in the family business, Fernwood Lumber Company. Philip Jr. had caught the golfing bug while away at college, and he and his brother Edgar would often visit their uncle in Hazelhurst to play at one of the first courses that existed in Mississippi called Brown's Wells. Inspired both by this newfound hobby and by their interest in continuing to develop the Fernwood community, Philip Jr. convinced Fernwood Lumber Company to donate 64 acres of land so that a three-hole golf course could be constructed. Those original three holes were built adjacent to what is now Highway 51, but was then called the Brick Road. That original three-hole course, which are now holes four, five, and six on the front nine, was made available to anyone local that wanted to give the game a go. By 1923, a decision was made to try and form an official country club, A club charter was drafted and eventually approved by Governor Whitfield on June 2nd, 1924. And that same year, the three holes were expanded to become what is now known as the Front Nine. By 1925, a clubhouse was under construction. And by 1926, the original pool was built. In 1927, the first tennis courts were added. There are a few noteworthy attributes of the early club facilities that I think are worth mentioning. The original nine holes had what was one of the longest holes in the country at the time and one of the few par six holes in existence. 
Right off the bat, Frontwood Country Club established itself as a club designed for members with strong constitutions and the ability to battle through tough conditions. The original greens, and I use air quotes around greens, were both elevated and made of hard-pressed dirt. Not making it onto the green meant your ball might roll 20 to 30 yards away from the hole, and making it onto the green was apparently about the same as landing in a sand trap. The original swimming pool was constructed of exposed concrete and aggregate, so it was pretty tough on feet. The young kids of the time learned a good reason to spend their summers barefooted so they could toughen up their souls and maximize pool time. The original pool also did not have a filtering system, so it had to be drained and refilled from a natural spring on a weekly basis. Apparently, Fernwood Country Club was very early on in setting the trend we now know as cold plunging. I share these details to point out that while, yes, we are talking about a country club and all of the fanciness and fanfare that this term might entail, but we are also talking about a club that has had an impressive hard scrabble history with a proven pattern of rising up again from the ashes and continuing to endure through the most challenging of circumstances. It was that spirit of perseverance that helped such a young club endure through the difficult times of the Great Depression that started in the late 1920s and lasted into the 1930s. According to Diddle, the club was able to endure those tough times in rather fine style. The club hosted some impressive dances in those early days, with some of the best-known big bands of the era performing at them. According to one of the early members who shared this story, Linda Bilbo found one of these dances a bit too subdued for her taste and took it upon herself to spice things up a bit by tossing a cache of fireworks, including a gross of Roman candles, into the clubhouse fireplace around midnight. Fortunately, this spontaneous act didn't result in yet another notable club fire, but evidence of those exploded Roman candles remained on the walls and ceiling of the club for several years thereafter. In his written history, Diddle shared a few personal memories of his early experiences at the club. He noted that the golf clubs themselves had different and more colorful set of names in the 30s. The two wood was called a brassy, the three wood, a spoon, and a five wood was called the clique. A niblick was the equivalent of an eight or nine iron and the mashy the equivalent of a five iron. Those names sound like various species encountered on episodes of the TV show Star Trek. He also talked about the predominantly black caddies that worked at the club in the 30s and the 40s, and his own experience joining their ranks as a caddy around 1940. The club allowed the caddies to play the course on Monday mornings, and Dad recounted some fond memories of playing shootouts and scats for five cents a hole with carryovers. Diddle said that some of those short putts got pretty hairy after several carryovers since the caddies were often the best players in town. He talked about a men's social club that was formed in the late 30s called the Cheese and Cracker Club, which was soon followed by a ladies' club called the T&T Club. He shared stories of professional golfers and trick shot artists who would sometimes make their way through the area and put on an exhibition. One of those was a fellow named Joe Kirkwood, who was quite renowned at the time, and I have some of the original documents between the club and Mr. Kirkwood arranging his event. In 1962, a decision was made to expand the course, and by July 4th, 1963, the back nine was officially opened. By 1966, a pro shop, a men's locker room, and a club office were housed in a wooden-framed building some 200 feet south and west of the main clubhouse. This separate wood structure that housed the pro shop and men's locker room burned completely on September 4, 1966, and practically all of the club records existing at that time were lost. In 1967, Teddy Solomon was appointed to head up a new building committee, and Rags Watkins was hired to develop architectural plans for the new structure. 
The extensive rebuilding plan came at a price tag of $152,000. It was approved and Neil Faust was elected as the new president. The club suffered yet another significant fire in 1998, and a second rebuilding program was proposed and approved, this time at a price tag of $1.2 million. The Fernwood Country Club once again demonstrated the same fortitude as the pine forests that are surrounding it, with the ability to recover and rise again after a fire with new life and energy. This current version of the club we are in today remains the beautiful regrowth from that last fire. I'm sure there are pieces of the club's history that I'm unfamiliar with, and there are likely some noteworthy stories that others might be able to share. I'm equally sure that this wonderful club that has provided so much joy and entertainment to so many now for 100 years will continue to thrive for another 100 years and ensure there are more colorful stories to be told when that birthday arrives.